Our goal is to now properly define expectation as integration with respect to our measure. That means we need to figure out how to define the integral of f d mu, where mu is a measure on a measure space, and f is an appropriate kind of measurable function. For us, that's going to mean a Borel measurable function. We will, of course, see that not every Borel measurable function will be integrable in the sense that this makes consistent sense, but it will be easy to understand the ones that are, and those will become the random variables that we are most interested in. To motivate our discussion, let's consider radon measures on the real line. We characterize those as being associated to two Stilchus integrators, that is, the radon measure of any half-open interval can be calculated by the difference of some non-decreasing right continuous function at the endpoints. That should remind us of the riemann stilchus integral. And so let's review how that integral is defined to give us some insight into how to define integrals with respect to other measures. Here, we restrict our attention to a compact interval from a up to b, and we integrate a sufficiently nice function against that riemann stilchus integrator, often written like this, although we'll write it more like this to be consistent with integration against a measure that we're trying to develop, in the following way that you learned in calculus class. This picture really summarizes the process. You subdivide the domain into some partition of points between A and B. And then on each of the partition intervals, you look at the infimal value of the function and the supremal value of the function. And that gives you two approximations of what the integral ought to be. The upper sum and the lower sum. And that is, we sum up the areas of the tall rectangles, the supremum of the function on the intervals, where the base of the rectangle is given length equal to the difference of f at the endpoints. For the lower sums, we do the same, but with the lower heights, the infimum of the function on those intervals. We do that for each possible partition pi of the domain, and then we take the infimum over all partitions of the upper sums, or the supremum over all partitions of the lower sums. In each case, this corresponds to making the partition mesh, the maximum width of any partition interval, smaller and smaller. Indeed, if I were to subdivide this partition in two pieces, then the supremum on the left half would stay the same, but the supremum on the right half, in this case, would shrink. And that means that as I take the mesh smaller and smaller, the upper sum gets smaller and smaller. And so its infimum is approaching the area under the curve. Similarly, if I look at the lower sums, subdividing will only increase the value on some of the intervals. And so taking the supremum here will approach the area under the curve. If that is a well-defined term, to be clear. It is perfectly possible for these two quantities to be unequal. It is only if they're equal that we call the function riemann stilchus integrable on the interval from a up to b and define its integral to equal this common value. Now is that a good way for us to proceed to try to define integrals with respect to measures in general? Remember, we'd like to be able to integrate a large robust class of measurable functions here. This process is too limited in a number of ways, and let's take a look at why. For starters, it fundamentally only works on a compact interval as its domain. If we were doing this in higher dimensions, it's only going to work on a compact domain in general, and we would like to consider random variables that are defined on a probability space where we don't want to deal with questions about compact support if we don't need to. It also only works for bounded functions. Those upper sums will always be infinite if the function is unbounded on its domain. 
even though the integral might well be defined in the classical Riemann integration sense by a limiting process as we approach some kind of asymptote. We don't want to have to deal with that here. More difficult for us is the fact that this integral is not very robust under many different kinds of limits. And we've seen that the class of measurable functions is very robust under limits, so we would like integrals with respect to them to be robust as well. But really the most fundamental reason why the riemann stilchus integral is just not going to cut it for us is that it fails to integrate even very simple functions. Let's take a look, for example, at this function, the indicator function of the rationals restricted to some compact interval from a up to b. It's very difficult to draw the graph of this function. It really does look like a solid line at height 1 and a solid line at height 0 to our eyes because the rationals and their complement, the irrationals, are dense in the real numbers. But this is very problematic for the upper and lower sums in the Riemann-Stilchus integral. No matter what kind of partition I choose, I see that on each partition interval, the supremal value will be 1, and the infimal value will be 0. Because in any interval, there are both rational and irrational numbers. So that means that the supremum on any such interval from, say, s up to t of f is 1, and the infimum on that same interval of f is always 0, which means that the upper sum on any partition is going to be the sum of 1 times the Stilchus measure of that interval, which is f at tn minus f at tn minus 1, if the interval in question goes from tn minus 1 up to tn. Well, that's just a telescoping sum, and it works out to f at b minus f at a. All of the upper sums for any partition will just be the difference of f at the endpoints of the interval, whereas the lower sums will be the sum of 0 times the same, which of course will just be 0. And those are probably not equal. That is, we see that this function is riemann stilchus integrable on an interval if and only if the function f is constant on that interval, in which case the integral is just zero, which is not very interesting. So here's the rub. Not only is this a very simple function, it is a simple function in our technical sense. It is the nicest kind of measurable function. If we can't even integrate those, we got a real problem. So what really went wrong here? The issue is that we're using intervals in the domain fundamentally to define the integral. And that means that this whole type of integral, the riemann stilchus integral, is designed only for functions that are well adapted to interval partitions in their domain. For example, those for which the preimage of the function on an interval is a nice collection of intervals in the domain that matches with the definition of the riemann stilchus integral. So this will certainly be true for continuous functions. After all, for a continuous function, the preimage of an open set is an open set, and we know that open sets in the real line are countable disjoint unions of open intervals. And those are the kinds of sets that when restricted to a bounded domain, the riemann stilchus integral will have no trouble handling. Our test function, the indicator function of the rationals, does not look like this. It is discontinuous at all points of the real line. Although it is bounded, it oscillates fast on all scales. That's certainly possible for measurable functions, but not for continuous functions. And actually, it turns out that the Riemann-Stilchus integral, at least in the case where the integrator is the Lebesgue measure, really only makes sense for functions that are very, very close to continuous. Here's the theorem 
Suppose f is a bounded function defined on a compact interval in the real line. Then it is Riemann integrable, meaning that it is Riemann Stilchus integrable with respect to the Lebesgue measure as the integrator, if and only if its set of discontinuities in that interval has Lebesgue measure zero. Let's be very precise about this. I'm using a bar over the Lebesgue measure to indicate that this is the completion. Any completion that we want to use, they're all the same, either the Carretier-Dori Frechet construction or the construction we used in driver's notes via the pseudometric or simply by taking the Borel sigma field and completing it with respect to null sets. All of those produce the same sigma field called the Lebesgue sigma field. The theorem is that a function is Riemann integrable if and only if its set of discontinuities is a Lebesgue set of measure zero. We might summarize this by saying that the function is continuous almost everywhere, but we need to be very clear that that means that the set of discontinuities need not be a Borel set. It is only necessarily in the completion of the Borel sigma field with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Nevertheless, that is a very restricted class of measurable functions, and we'd like to go beyond it. So how do we do that? The answer, which is really the fundamental contribution that Lebesgue made to this whole theory, is to subdivide the range instead of the domain of the function. We start with a measurable function on the real line, f, and instead of partitioning its domain, we partition the range of the function. On each interval in the range, we approximate the function by its value either at the top or the bottom, and then look at the set where the function takes values in between those two heights and see that it is a nice set in the domain. Nice with our new eyes from measure theory, it will be a measurable set. Not necessarily a nice union of intervals, but still something that we'll be able to handle. So that is, we're going to approximate what we want the integral to be by a sum of either the supremum or the infimum on the interval in the range, meaning that we look at the pre-image of f, of the measure of that pre-image. We're still taking areas of rectangles and adding them up, but the rectangles are now based on measurable sets instead of just intervals. Now that supremum or infimum is just going to be Tn or Tn minus one. And so we'll have a sum similar to a Riemann sum that we can take a limit of as the distance between the Tn's goes to zero. Now, if we think about this for a little while or notice in particular that this picture is the same picture that we used when we talked about approximating measurable functions by simple functions, is that what we're really doing here is we're taking an arbitrary measurable function and we're approximating it by simple functions. Simple functions that are adapted to a partition of the range. We know how to approximate any measurable function by simple functions really well. And that approximation scheme will allow us to define an integral of measurable functions as soon as we know how to integrate simple functions. So that is our next goal.